gold. And their hooves were decorated with pure silver. And their bodies were clothed with precious embroidered silk. And they were getting choice, delicious grasses and other such foods that the cows would eat and giving them uh, each cow to their full satisfaction and each bull and each calf. And they were offering pujas to the cows and by Krishna's arrangement they circumambulated the cows and then they circumambulated the Brahmins who were giving blessings and the culmination of the day after everyone was fed, it's with singing and dancing and laughing, the first parikrama of Govardhanya, led by Krishna. Some of the gopis, like Jashoda and Rohini, they rode on ox carts. Srimati Radharani, the gopis, they were also, many of them, on beautiful little carts or chariots going around Govardhan Hill. And Krishna and the cowherd boys, they were there with the cows and the calves with their little sticks joking and dancing going around Govardhan Hill. After the parikrama was complete, everyone was so satisfied. Every year before, Indra Puja was kind of a boring ritual. <laughs> but this was really a happy moment because it, Krishna made everything so um, exciting and so full of love and full of color. And it was beautiful. Then they all went to their homes and everyone was so happy except Indra. Indra was furious. In Bhagavad Gita it is said, Kama Esha Kuroda Esha Rajoguna Samudbhava. When there is Kama, Kama means that passion for selfish enjoyment. It could be sex. It could be, you know, some form of entertainment. It could be the greed to accumulate more and more. Or subtle karma is the desire for profit adoration or dis distinction. That was a very distinct <laughs> sound. When these desires are frustrated, when they are unfulfilled, they cause anger, kuroda. And anger is such a thing, it's like fire. It could be so uncontrolled that in the spur of anger, sometimes we don't, we lose our intelligence. The Gita explains, from anger, there's a bewilderment of memory. When the memory is bewildered, intelligence is lost. When intelligence is lost, then we do foolish things. That's what happened to Indra. All the other demigods are watching. And Indra is waiting for his ceremonial puja from Nanda Maharaja's community. And he sees, and everyone else is see, that they're not giving it to Indra. They're giving it to cows and to a hill. He was insulted. And he totally lost his intelligence. 
he was so wild with anger that he called for the Samvartaka clouds. These are not just rain clouds. These are the clouds that are specifically and exclusively called upon for the purpose of the universal destruction. These are the clouds that pour so hard on the earth planet that the entire earth becomes one huge ocean. No land survives. It's all underwater. Total devastation. He called those clouds because he's their master. And he screamed at them. I have been insulted. And it's interesting. We were speaking yesterday about how the world is a mirror of our own consciousness. If we're seeing other people as being envious, if we sing other people for all these defects and faults, it's very likely we're seeing it that way because we have those faults. There's that simple saying, whenever you point one finger toward another, there are three pointing toward you. So we should actually, um, we should analyze ourselves at least three times more than we analyze other people as far as how to improve. So Indra, he's screaming out to the Samvartaka clouds and to the demigods of the wind and the storms. He's saying, just see what has happened to Nanda. Nanda, because of my grace, he has so much wealth. His riches are enormous. So many crops, so many cows, and he trades it, he barters it, he has so much gold and so much jewels. He has so much wealth and so much power because of the wealth. And look at what has happened to him. Because of his influence and his riches, he has become proud. And because of his pride, he's dishonoring a great person like me in favor of a talkative little foolish mortal child like Krishna. Just see how he has become bewildered. He must be punished. He was talking about himself. But he didn't, but he's seeing the faults in others. The fact is, because of his wealth and because of his power, he was insulting the Supreme Personality of Godhead because he was listening to his own mind, which is just a foolish, mortal little child compared to Krishna. But when Childish people with childish mentalities have enormous material power. They can be very dangerous. He ordered the clouds, destroy the cows, destroy the community of Vrindavan immediately. And Indra sent massive windstorms. Suddenly, here in Brudge Bhumi, there was this wind just blowing and blowing. And then they saw in the sky the Samvataka clouds formulating. Massive, thick, endless, dark clouds. And the thunder. Everything was happening in stages, first winds, then clouds, then the thunder was rumbling constantly in all directions. This thunder was so immense, it was rumbling with such depth that the world was shaking. 
And then lightning bolts were just flashing. Very fearful. They were flashing and crashing, flashing in the sky, flashing in the clouds, crashing down to the earth. Limitless thunderbolts. Then the rain began. When it began the rain, according to the Garga Samhita, there was limitless rain, and every raindrop was coming down at a massive speed, and each drop was the size of an elephant. Then, as the rainstorm accelerated, it wasn't even coming in drops anymore. The rain was falling from the sky in pillars, just pouring down. And then, much, it became so windy and so cold that much of the rain became hail. Hail means it turned into ice. Massive, solid ice balls the size of elephants were pouring down, limitless. The cows, <laughs> they're out in the pastures with their little calves. The cows, their only thought was to protect their little calves. They were not thinking, oh, I'm so cold. They're thinking, what will happen to my little calf? And each cow, they have that kind of hanging flesh under their necks. They were trying to cover their little calf's heads with that flesh, and they were putting the calf under their body to try to protect it from the hailstorms and the rain, and they were cuddling the calves to protect it from the cold, and seeing their calves crying and trembling, the cows were weeping, crying out helplessly for Krishna. And the bulls, this, the hail and the rain would come, would crash down on, the, on their horns and the hump of their neck and the they, bulls with very angry red eyes. <laughs> they were... <laughs> they were very unhappy with Indra. <laughs> it was such a helpless condition. Within a matter of seconds, the whole of Braj Bhumi was becoming a lake of water, totally filled. You couldn't see what was a high place and what was a low place. In that desperate condition, all the Vrajabhasis, they put the cows and the calves in front of them and all went to Krishna's house and prayed to Krishna. Krishna, Krishna, Mahabhaga. Krishna, you're very great. <laughs> this rain is tormenting us. It's causing us so much suffering. Look at your little cows who are so dear to you, how they are suffering. You promise to protect those who you are affectionate toward. Please protect your cows and protect us too. <laughs> this is what they were praying. Vishwana Chakravarti Thakur explains how the Brijbasis did not think Krishna to be God. But some of them have heard that Gargamuni, Gargamuni said that your little boy, Krishna, <laughs> he will be empowered by the, by the 
by the strength of Lord Narayan to protect all of you in the times of the greatest dangers. So they were thinking Krishna just to be their ordinary little child. But because in certain situations Narayan was giving him the strength to protect them, they all approached Krishna. And Krishna smiled. He was thinking of his devotee Indra. And then Krishna, he went from his house to Govardhan Hill. Usually, whenever there was some sort of demon or some sort of challenge to Krishna, he would prepare himself by tightening his belt. He had a cloth belt. It was tied. He would just retie it a little tighter, ready for action. But Krishna was so thorough. He knew Indra was watching. He didn't even bother to tighten his belt. This was really an insult. <laughs> he just went to the hill. And by his yoga maya potency, the path that he walked from his home to Govardhan Hill, not a drop of water could fall. So by the time Krishna got to Govardhan Hill, his little turban and his golden dhoti and his beautiful little flower garden, there wasn't a drop of water on it. There wasn't even any dust on it from the winds. And then, like a little child, effortlessly lifts up a mushroom, Krishna lifted Govardhan Hill. And he held the Govardhan Hill in his left hand above his head. It also says in Srimad Bhagavatam, like an elephant holds a lotus flower. That is how effortlessly Krishna was holding Giriraj. Kavi Karnapur tells when Krishna lifted this mountain. Now, let us try to, through the process of shravana or hearing, we could actually be there. Because the transcendental sound vibration of Krishna and Krishna's pastimes are non-different. To the degree we are absorbed in hearing these stories, we are actually there. Because they are timeless. It's a matter of bhava. It's not just a matter of geographical um, timing. Nityalila. So here we are in Vrindavan with all the Brijabhasis in all this torrents of rain and wind and hail and freezing cold and Krishna lifts this gigantic mountain. As he lifted the mountain from the ground even though he did it effortlessly to separate the mountain from the ground it made such massive sound that the earth shook. And Krishna lifted Giriraj above his head. And he smiled. And he said to all the Brijabhasis, he said, everyone, please, if it is your desire, come under Govardhan Hill. Govardhan was so pleased with the offering of all the food we gave him and the artis and the parikramas. He was so satisfied with our devotion that now he is assuming Bhakti Charu Swami Maharaj Ki Jai Hare Krishna 
Wonderful to see you, Mara. His Holiness Bhakti Charu Maharaj arrived just when Krishna lifted Govard on him. <laughs> come to give us shelter. <laughs> huh. Krishna said, everyone, whoever so desires, come. Giriraj is so pleased with us. He has become a beautiful umbrella. And look underneath the hill. All of the, everything just like our own home that we could ever want is right here provided by Giriraj. Everyone come. And Giriraj is so happy and he's so merciful that he's just floating in the sky to give us shelter. I'm effortlessly just putting my hand underneath. Everyone come and bring the most valuable things you have. So all the Brijabhasis with their cows and their calves and their bulls and the most valuable possessions, they all blissfully stream together under Govardhan Hill. Oh, how beautiful it was. It was absolutely charming. You see, Krishna, he, through his different energies, made it the most beautiful experience. Because if we try to rationally try to understand if all this rain is falling from one sense I mean let's be a little mundane in our logic right now it falls off Govardhan Hill and then it comes down to the ground and where does it go where does all the water go and at the same time in the places where Govardhan Hill is not an umbrella, the water's falling on the ground, and why doesn't it come and flood inside underneath the hill? Krishna arranged... He didn't even arrange it, it was just happening by his will. Sudarshan Chakra manifested himself to dry up the water after it hit the ground, so it wouldn't go under the hill. Anantashesha made a circle around the bottom of Govardhan so that all the water that was falling off would not actually come off the hill. And whatever little water did come, it looked like beautiful pearls dropping to make it very aesthetically beautiful. So in this way, Indra could not get a single raindrop to go under Govardhan Hill. And as everyone was underneath this jeweled umbrella of Giriraj, they were all in a circle around Gididhari, this beautiful form of Krishna. It was a threefold form where Krishna was holding the hill with the little finger of his left hand. All the cows, all the calves, all the bulls, all the gopas, all the gopis, all the living beings of Brindaman were gazing upon the beautiful face of Krishna. And Giriraj, 
Gididhari. He was gazing at each and every one of his devotees. Each one, their eyes, it was almost impossible for even them to blink. They were gazing upon the moon-like face of Krishna. Just as a Chakora bird gazes upon the moon and drinks the nectar of the moon through its eyes and to its heart. As Krishna smiled and glanced at each devotee, they were so satisfied that for seven days and seven nights nobody felt the slightest hunger or thirst. They never ever wanted this wonderful darshan to end. And each devotee, according to their natural love for Krishna, Krishna was reciprocating with them. To those in Shantaras, they were simply gazing upon Krishna, beholding and loving, beholding his beauty and receiving his love and offering their love. For Raktak and Patrak, who are in Dasyaras, seeing Krishna lifting the Govardhan hill in this way, they were doing every type of little service. Sometimes they were fanning him and sometimes they were singing for him. And Sakyaras, his friends, Subal, Sridama, Madhu Mangal, they were laughing with Krishna, joking with Krishna. Vatsaliras, they were in anxiety of love because of their parental affection. They were seeing Krishna holding this big mountain. Yashoda Mai, she was saying, Krishna, how could I tolerate seeing you like this? Why are you so mischievous? For so many years, for so many generations, we were having nice, peaceful Indra Pujas. And you're so uncontrolled in your senses that you went and told us not to worship Indra and now he's so angry and now he's shooting all of these thunderbolts and all of this rain on us and, and you're holding Govardhan Hill. It looks so heavy. Madhu Mangal. He was in a joking ras. Those with Vatsalya ras were worried about Krishna. Those with Sakya ras, they were just playing. Madhu Mangal said, Yashoda Mai, why are you saying like this? Why should we worship Indra? Look at what a fool this Indra is. Just because he didn't get what he wants, he's so envious and he's so angry, he's trying to destroy us all. Why should we worship a person like that? And now we are drinking the sweet nectar of seeing Krishna in his giddy dari form. What could be better than this? You showed him how he said, Madhu Mango, why are you so impudent? Why are you saying this? What is so nectar about my little son standing, holding a giant mountain with his finger? Don't you see he's perspiring? Don't you see he's become pale? Don't you see he hasn't moved in so many hours? How can you say that this is nectar? This is causing such pain to my heart. Madhu Mangal said, no, you just showed him I don't worry like this. Krishna is not lifting over down here. I have chanted Brahminical mantras. 
and due to my mantras, it is upholding Govardhan Hill. Krishna is just standing there. He showed him, I said, why are you saying like this? I'm suffering and you're making jokes and Krishna's standing, he's so fatigued and you're making jokes about it. Nanda Maharaj, he said to Yashoda Mai, he said, why are you chastising Madhu Mangal? Krishna needs encouragement at this moment and Madhu Mangal is giving him encouragement. <laughs> Krishna said to Yashoda Mai, he said, Mother, there's no pain. There's not even an effort. In fact, Giriraj was so pleased by our puja for him that he is just floating in the air, just as a formality, as an instrument. My hand is underneath him, but there's no weight. And you showed him I. She said, Krishna, I will only believe that if Giriraj starts floating around in the sky and disconnects from your finger. How can I, as your mother, tolerate this? And then from the heart of her heart, Mother Yashoda prayed to Giriraj. She prayed, if I have ever done anything to please you, if I have ever done any pious deeds that have pleased Lord Narayan, offer me this one benediction. Krishna's hand is as soft as a lotus. As he's holding you, please be soft. And Krishna's arm is so small and so delicate. Please be very light so that he doesn't feel any pain. This was her prayer. It reminds us of Sachi Devi, who was Yashoda Mai in Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's Leela. In Sri Vasangam, sometimes her beloved son Nimai Goranga, he would dance in Kirtan. And he would be in such ecstatic samadhi of Sankirtan. Sometimes he would jump way, way high in the air and then he would go into a samadhi and just, just fall to the ground like a bag of bones as far as Sachi would see. And it would break her heart and she prayed. She prayed to Lord Krishna if ever I have ever done anything to please you, whatever pious credits, whatever devotional service I've ever rendered in this life or any previous life, I only ask one benediction. That whenever my little child Nimai falls to the ground like this, that he will not f feel any pain. And the other benediction is when he falls to the ground like this, give me the benediction that I don't see it. So Krishna was lifting Giriraj. Yashoda Mai, <clears throat> she was <clears throat> in her Vatsalya parental motherly bath. As Krishna was holding Govardhan Hill with his left hand, everyone was gazing upon him. The Brahmins were blessing him. The boys were making fun with him. And Sri Radharani and all of her gopis, they were just gazing into his beautiful smiling face and through Krishna's glance and smile he was fully reciprocating with all of their hearts love 
they were taking that form of Giddhidhari through their eyes into the very core of their hearts and embracing him. And Krishna, as he was standing there holding Govardhan Hill in the core of his, their hearts, he was embracing them. What a festival! 24 hours a day for seven days, no one was separated from Krishna. Usually the cows would be in the pastures during the day, but then they would be in separation all night. The elderly gopas and gopis, they would be with Krishna in night and in the morning, and then all day they would be in separation. The boys would be all day and then all night. They didn't even sleep. They were just thinking about the day before's pastimes with Krishna and anticipating the next day. But now, and the gopis, they were always dreaming. When can we look at Krishna? To our heart's content, with no inhibitions. But now everybody, Krishna was giving himself fully to all the bridge bhasis, constantly. As he was holding Govardhan Hill with one, the left hand, he took his flute with his right hand out from his cloth belt and put it to his mouth and played sweet songs. When Krishna plays his flute, it's the intimacy of the ecstasy of the love of his heart that's emerging from his heart, coming through his mouth in the form of that air. It's not air, it's praying. It's his praying that's flowing through the holes of the flute and making that song. The vibration is simply Krishna's praying. Krishna, the, the love for of Krishna for each and every one of his devotees is manifesting in the most beautiful music, the origin of all music. And whoever's ears that that flute song enters into and goes down to the recess of their heart, Krishna personally, individually, uniquely reciprocates with that devotee, expressing his appreciation, his affection, his love, and receiving their love through that sound vibration. That is just a very superficial external understanding of the depth of the experience of Krishna's flute. He began to play his flute. Oh, what a wonderful sight this was. Madhu Mangal, he became very afraid. He said, I have seen anyone who hears the sound vibration of your flute goes into ecstasy. If Giriraj goes into ecstasy, then he may fall off your little finger and then we will all be crushed to death. And I've also seen the effects of your flute. The river Yamuna becomes stunned as if it's solid and stones and rocks and trees melt as if they're liquid. Giriraj, in his ecstasy, hearing your flute song, he may melt in love, and then if he melts, we will all be drowned. Madhu Mangal requested, Krishna, please stop playing your flute. It could cause the destruction of the whole Brijabasi dynasty or community. And some other gopas 
were saying, no, there's, they were enjoying the flute so much. They said, Giriraj is very grave. However ecstatic he is, he will maintain his, his, his stature and protect us. Nothing to fear. But listen to the sweet, melodious song of his flute and see him standing there. Charming our hearts. As the rains were pouring, it is described that there were two storms, one above the hill and one underneath the hill. Above the hill there were massive clouds, lightning, inundation of rain, rainbows. Underneath the hill, Krishna, his beautiful form of Giridhari, the complexion of a monsoon cloud was like the cloud. His golden dhoti was like lightning. His peacock feather was like a rainbow. His glance and his smile upon the Brijabhasis was like an inundating storm, showering them with love. And all of the Brijabhasis were drowning in that love. Seven days and seven nights, Indra, when he saw that the most destructive hurricanes, cyclones, tornadoes, any kind of windstorm, he was sending everything to somehow or other blow Giriraj off the tip of the little finger of Krishna's hand. But he couldn't do it. And Krishna was just a seven-year-old boy. It's not that he grew into a big size. When he became Giriraj, he did. But under the hill, he was just little Krishna. How is this possible? And with the clouds and the storms of devastation and all these winds, Giriraj, out of his pleasure, he actually expanded his body so that every single Brijbasi and all of their loved ones could fit comfortably underneath. Giriraj was very big. There were millions of trees on Govardhan Hill. And on each tree's numberless leaves and flowers. And on the ground, it was plush with fragrant green grass everywhere. In seven days, on top of the hill, Indra did not have the power to even slightly move a single 